Hello, and welcome to the Rutgers School of Engineering's 2021 Dean's Distinguished Lecture. I'm Tom Ferris, Dean of the Rutgers School of Engineering, and welcome. Each year, we celebrate National Engineers Week at Rutgers with a, a variety of, them, of events that engage students, alumni, and the broader community in engineering as a vital force in the world. I am pleased to welcome back to campus virtually SOE alumnus Dragos Machuca, our guest speaker, and Madeline Town, who will serve as moderator. Madeline and Dragos share a few things in common, though separated by a few years. Both earned degrees in mechanical engineering at Rutgers and were active members of the Rutgers Formula Race team as students. That gives me a chance to announce to all of you that yesterday the Rutgers Board of Governors approved uh, moving forward with construction of the Bruce and Phyllis Nicholas Engineering Student Project Studio. The, the Nicholas Studio will be the new home for Rutgers Formula Racing, and we plan to move in in May of 2022. Please welcome Madeline Bound. Thank you, Dean Ferris. Uh, again, my name is Madeline Bound, and I'm currently a grad student at Georgia Tech studying aerospace engineering. I work as a graduate research assistant in the Aerospace Systems Design Lab, and I was recently selected to be a Matthew Izakowitz Fellow. I graduated from Rutgers last year with a degree in mechanical engineering and a minor in English. During my time at Rutgers, I spent four years at Rutgers Formula Racing, where I served as vice president and later the testing and data acquisition lead. I'm pleased to introduce the 2021 Dean's Distinguished Lecturer, Rutgers Engineering alumnus, Dragos Machuca. After graduating from Rutgers with a degree in mechanical engineering, Dragos went on to earn advanced degrees, including a doctoral degree and MBA from University of California at Berkeley. His career includes 20 years of experience at Silicon Valley as an engineer and management professional in industries from automotive and consumer electronics to semiconductor manufacturing and aerospace working for such companies as Apple, Lockheed Martin, BMW, and Nissan. He is currently the Executive Technical Director at Ford's Research and Innovation Center in Palo Alto, California, where Ford is accelerating its development of technologies and experiments in connectivity, mobility, autonomous vehicles, customer experience, and big data. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dragos. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Dean. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, and. Let me jump right in. Um, since Madeline already made an excellent introduction, I'm going to go to, to the next slide. Uh, of course, now this thing is not responding. Hang on. There we go. Um, so, yes, I, when I was at Rutgers, I was part of the, the Formula SAE with a bunch of um, other guys. Um, uh, in, in the picture on the right, I'm in yellow, so a bit more hair, same lack of fashion that I have today. Um, after that, I moved to, to, to California, to Berkeley, um, and to get an, uh, a PhD in controls. Uh, I stuck with cars, um, so I worked on automated vehicles at the time. Um, different times, there was no way I was going to do a, a startup in the field the way a lot of people are doing today. So um, lesson learned that too early, it's uh, almost uh, as bad as being too late in a, in a, in a certain field. Um, and then I guess I liked uh, I like school too much and I went back for an MBA later. Um, and then between that and today where I'm at Ford, uh, I spent some time with BMW when car companies were just coming to Silicon Valley and I have a bit more on that uh, in the next slides. Um, I work for KLA Tencor, uh, currently known only as KLA, uh, do doing semiconductor uh, manufacturing. Lockheed, I work on their space systems group, uh, also in, um, in Silicon Valley. And then I spent some time at Apple, not in the supposedly non-existing car group, but in the, in the camera group, uh, where I did the uh, optical image stabilization for the um, iPhone 6. Um, and now, for the last six years, I've been running the Ford uh, Technology Office in, uh, in Palo Alto. Um, basically, now we're, we're going through this inflection point in uh, the automotive industry. So what it means to, to, to be in Silicon Valley basically means looking at autonomy, at software, at sensors, 
Um, the other way I describe this to, to people who ask us what we work on is basically everything that is not traditional cars. So it's not engines, not transmissions, not suspensions. Um, all, the, all the fun stuff that got me in this industry, that's exactly what we don't work on. Uh, we work on basically the, the uh, uh, iPhone on wheels type thing. Um, and we also interact a lot with startups um, to look for new technologies, to new, look for um, what's, what's coming up in the future and for areas that the, the tier one suppliers and the traditional supply chain in the automotive industry uh, may not be ready to, to give us. Um, just to put things in context, uh, Ford has um, three, well, by, when, when we were founded, we had two research centers, one in Michigan uh, and one in Germany in Aachen. We were the third one in, um, in Palo Alto. And um, after our success, we recently opened another one in Tel Aviv. So now we have uh, four research centers throughout the world uh, where we tap in different technologies uh, that those geographies can can offer. Um, to put things in perspective, when I started, so when I joined BMW, um, we were only the second car company to, to have a presence in the Valley. Uh, Mercedes was first, they came in 97, uh, BMW was second, uh, 99, and then just a couple of more other companies, uh, car companies showed up, uh, Volkswagen, uh, GM, Toyota set up shop. Um, Pretty much from, from the early 2000s until about five years ago, um, this was the map of the automotive industry in Silicon Valley. The, the biggest change was, was Tesla that came in between uh, these, these, these 20 years. Um, and then things started happening really quickly. Um, first of all, the biggest change is that um, the venture capitalists used to absolutely hate investing in the automotive industry uh, because they saw us as slow and stupid and they didn't think that they are going to get their returns anytime soon. Um, but all of a sudden you start seeing some boutique VCs that realize that there is an inflection point in the auto automotive industry. We started speaking their language, uh, in other words, speaking software, speaking cybersecurity, machine learning. Um, and all of a sudden you see these few boutique uh, VCs that start investing in startups that were dedicated to the automotive industry rather than startups that had some technology that could be applied to the automotive industry. Um, and then things start moving really quick. Um, I, I have to give credit to, to, to GM when, when they bought Cruise um, and the rumor had it, it was a billion dollars. I don't think it was a billion, uh, but it was probably less, but at least it got on, on VC's radar screen all of a sudden, other VCs started investing in the automotive industry. And of course, where, where the money goes, the technology follows. Um, so we started seeing a lot more uh, startups dedicated to the automotive industry. We started seeing more uh, tier one suppliers show up um, and even more OEMs that don't even sell in the US like, like Peugeot and a bunch of um, Chinese startup uh, car companies. And then from there on, things started picking up. This was 2018, uh, early 2019, and this was late 2019 and early 2020. So all of a sudden, there is this, this explosion of companies that are dedicated to, to the automotive industry. Um, anecdotally, also when, when I joined, we had only two LiDAR companies for uh, autonomous vehicles. Now I'm tracking upwards of 100. Um, about three, four years ago, in, if you wanted a, an AI chip to, to do machine learning, uh, NVIDIA was the, the only answer. Now we're tracking some 60 AI chip companies that are trying to take on NVIDIA with uh, dedicated machine learning chips uh, rather than chips that were initially meant for um, gaming and, and graphics uh, and then got adapted to, uh, to, to machine learning. Um, in fact, Last year, um, the Silicon Valley, who hasn't in invested in silicon for, for some 10 years, um, invested more in silicon than in the previous 10 years. So there's definitely a shift uh, that's, that's driven by, by all this um, autonomy and changes in the automotive industry. Um, and and why, why are we seeing this 
huge changes. Um, they're basically macro trends that lead into specifics into what we're doing. Um, so you have environmental challenges uh, through, throughout the world, basically the, the climate crisis that need to be addressed, which translates into either the downsizing of the internal combustion engine um, or better into electric vehicles. So that means that we need to start changing the, the, the powertrains and, and how those um, interact with, with the rest of the supply chain. Um, we have these mobile devices that we have all over with us and we're constantly connected. And the vehicle, it's one of the last areas, the last devices that you have that's not connected. And now those uh, um, devices are starting to, 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 to be connected. And you can see it kind of pains me to call a car a device, but we are moving towards that, that, that world where um, for, for, for a daily drive, the car becomes this, this device that moves you from point A to point B. Um, and, and that pleasure of driving is probably going to be pushed more towards the, 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 the weekend racing. Um, you have urbanization and the, the emphasis of this personal, physical ownership and the move towards um, shared uh, driving and what happens to the brand identity in that case. Um, and and gen then just in general globalization and how the, the emerging markets are, are affecting this, this entire industry. Um, and, and these trends specifically um, are acting on, on the automotive industry in this area that we call ACES is basically autonomous, connected, electrified and shared. And they're all different than what we're used to for the last hundred years. Um, so in terms of autonomy until now, again, it was about all that, the pleasure of driving and how the car feels and how, you know, how fast it goes around the Nürburgring. And now it's all about safety and autonomy and getting you to, from point A to point B safe, safely and allowing you, giving you time back so you can actually be productive or check your email and do other things. Um, again, the car was the last device that you had that, that wasn't connected. And now we're connecting the vehicle to, to the infrastructure. So it's not only for the people inside the car, but for the vehicle itself. And our understanding of what goes on in the vehicle in real time rather than through repairs at the, at the dealership and the interaction between the vehicle and the other vehicles and the infrastructure. So V2V, V2I, V2X. Um, electrification, it's, it's huge, not only in terms of what it does for, for, for climate change and, and our responsibility for that, um, but the fact that it's lowering the barriers to entry tremendously. So knowing how to build an internal combustion engine was a really difficult thing. So making it reliable, making it able to start in, in Alaska and Saudi Arabia, making it so that it meets emission standards. Um, all these things were, were learned over, over many years and many painful years of, of engineering and frankly errors along the way. All of a sudden you switch to an electric powertrain. It's first of all, you meet emission standards immediately. You have lower number of, of components. You have fewer moving parts. All of a sudden, I'm not saying that it's easy, but it's a lot easier than building an internal combustion engine. And so the barriers to entering this industry have been reduced dramatically, which allows a lot more uh, participants, a lot more competitors in, in this field. Um, then you have this, this, this share component, which obviously has gone a bit away over the last, uh, over, over COVID, but um, sharing a vehicle and where does the brand go in that case and what kind of experience can you provide to still identify the brand? Because when, um, when Uber picks you up today, you, you care less about what brand it is or what color that car it is versus when you own it. But you do care a lot about how the interior is, how clean it is, how safe is the ride. And so we're changing from that um, almost emotional attachment to this object and, and, and the pleasure of looking at it and having it in your driveway to making the interiors your, your own and customized for that five minute drive. Um, so let's talk about each one of those individually. Um, the first concept of an autonomous vehicle actually started quite early. Um, it's, it's not a new concept. Um, and this was at the New York City Fair, um, the, the concept that, that GM came up with. Of course, that 
happy family playing games in the car. Um, the funny thing is that you still see some conceptual um, images showing some form of family being happily talking to each other in an autonomous vehicle rather than watching it, their own screens. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see where that goes. Uh, but it was a pretty early concept. Um, then, as I said, back in 97, this is what, what I work on. Um, if you want to be precise with, with the words, uh, this is more automated vehicles than autonomous because there was a lot of interaction between the vehicles, and a lot of interaction with um, with the infrastructure just to make them run. Um, and uh, you'll see that the pendulum is actually swinging from, from this to, to, to fully autonomous and somewhere towards the middle today, but I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then you have the DARPA Urban Challenge, um, which first introduced the concept of autonomous. So no, no reliance on the infrastructure, all the intelligence was on the vehicle. Um, so all of a sudden you're, you're, you're putting, you're taking all that intelligence and putting it in each, in each vehicle. Um, the reality is that today, you know, obviously with COVID, this doesn't look as bad, but we don't want COVID to keep people from, from driving. But this is what the reality is today. It's not that, um, that, fantastic world where, where everything is, is autonomous. It's not, um, you know, traffic moving smoothly. So we still have, we still have a way to go to, to realize that, that utopia of, of, of autonomy. Um, so for, for the next few slides, I need to talk a bit in terms of these levels of autonomy. So a really quick introduction for those who don't know. Um, SAE, the Society of Automotive Engineers, the, the, defines these six levels of autonomy. Zero is basically nothing, no, no autonomy at all. Um, most of us in today's more modern cars, we drive in level one where you have some sort of um, autonomous um, uh, automated um, cruise control or uh, 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 sorry, autonomous cruise control or automated traction control. Uh, there's some level of lane centering um, you, you, you get a bit of this autonomy in, in the vehicles today. Um, level two will allow you to, to actually take your hands off. Uh, it's basically what, what Tesla is offering in their autopilot. Um, level three is the first level where you actually can take your eyes off the road uh, and safely check your email while the, while the car drives, but you're still responsible for um, for driving the vehicle in, in certain portions. So let's say typically city driving, you do manually, highway driving, uh, the vehicle takes over. Um, but it's, it's the first level where, where you can let the vehicle drive for you. Um, also, um, it's, it's still a privately owned vehicle. So it still has, um, you still own it. Uh, the, the, the sensors are still put on, on, on the vehicle. Um, and it still has brake pedals and, and steering wheel. Level four, there should be actually a, a much thicker separation between level three and level four. Level four is the first level of full autonomy. Um, so the cars will actually not have controls. Uh, they drive autonomously, uh, but they will be geofenced. So very restricted areas where they can operate, um, maybe not even operate in certain conditions. So. If we have a freak snowstorm in San Francisco, you wouldn't expect them to operate in that environment. Um, and then you have level five, which is full autonomy under any condition, under any circumstances. So driving rural, urban, suburban, rain, sleet, snow, it doesn't matter. Um, you can drive it. Frankly, I think that level is just never going to happen. Um, it's, uh, it's something that um, probably doesn't even have doesn't make financial sense. It doesn't make sense from uh, from a business point of view, but it's also technologically um, extremely difficult. So my personal opinion is we'll, we're, we're going to find different solutions before we hit level five. Uh, but most of the work most of us are doing today are somewhere between level two plus and, and, and level four. Um, the way I like to think of, of this environment is in sort of not, not to be too, too, much, too consultant about it, but in this two by two matrix, you know, four quadrants where uh, in, in terms of chaos and, and speed. Um, so most of OEMs, just because of the vehicles that we make, the, the form factors that we're used to, um, we're typically working on, on robot taxis. Um, so 
the, the challenge with this is that you, you would operate both highways and cities. Um, so you're going to have both high speed and high chaos. And therefore, it's going to be relatively difficult um, to, to bring them to, to the level where um, you, you can safely release something like this in, in public. Um, however, the really interesting thing is that from the work we've been doing, um, you now have technology and subsystems that are starting to sort of leak into other areas. Um, so if you go down one axis, you have tracking. Uh, so the idea is that you run tracking city edge to city edge. Um, and so it's basically highway only. You reduce your chaos, chaos tremendously because you don't have intersections, you don't have traffic signs, you don't have pedestrians, bicyclists. Um, so at that point is a lot easier. You still have high speed and high mass, which makes it difficult. Uh, you need to see pretty far out with, with, with your sensors. Um, but the environment is a lot more benign in terms of chaos. Um, if you go down the, the other axis, you have all these delivery shuttles um, that, that operate in the city. So very high chaos environment, but they can travel at 25 miles an hour. Uh, and at that speed, even if you detect someone late, you can just slam on the brakes. Um, if it's in terms of deliveries, you don't even have to worry about passenger comfort. So you don't have to worry about accelerations and jerks and, and all that. So it's it's an environment that, that's benign in terms of speed and when you can react to uh, to dangers. Um, and then you go, if you go down into, into the diagonal, um, you have all these off-road, all these off-road applications that are mining, construction, agriculture, um, and there are a tremendous number of startups that are starting to work in this space where you can relieve humans from, from doing a lot of uh, unsafe and monotonous work uh, by, by having all these um, robots basically doing work in a uh, low chaos, low speed, uh, low speed environment uh, where again, the, the danger of, of running over someone, it's, it's, it's relatively low. Um, so that's sort of the, the space that, that, that we operate in. Um, and again, out of the 100 LiDAR companies that we're looking at, they all put pressure on each other. The costs are coming down tremendously. Um, anecdotally, I was at a VC meeting one time and, and this, this person comes to me and starts thanking me and I had no idea why. Turns out she was the CEO of a um, startup that was doing construction, laying drywall. So she has rope, makes robots that lay drywall. And she was thanking me as a representative of the automotive industry that we pushed the cost of LiDAR so low that now she can put one on each robot that, that she's making. Um, so again, a, a, a tremendous amount of progress that's being made in this space. Um, to me, I think that the, the challenge is for, especially for robot taxis, is that even if we are safer than, than human beings, we need to be a lot safer uh, because right now as human beings driving, we kill about 40,000 people in the US. Um, even if we are 10 times better, that means we would still kill 4,000 people. And that's still not acceptable from, um, from a human point of view, that when, when a robot kills someone you, you, you love, even though in aggregate, we've saved 36,000 lives. Um, so I think there's still going to be some challenges to, to full deployment. Um, you can also look at this from, from the new players that are coming in, as I said, because of um, electric vehicles, uh, it's, it's, it's opening the space to a lot of new players to, to come in. So not only do we have competitors from the traditional OEMs that are coming into the space, but um, you have a lot of the software companies who do the perception coming in from, so we are, you know, we have the vehicles, we put perception on top of the vehicles. These companies have developed the perception first and now they're putting it on, on vehicles and maybe even build their own. Um, you have all these companies like Uber and Lyft that they need autonomy as part of their business model because as low as they push the cost of the driver, it's still a significant part of their cost. So if they can remove the driver, uh, their business model closes a lot better. So they have an incentive to come into, into this space. Um, so the, the, the dynamics in, in this industry are changing dramatically because you, you have a lot of new entrants in, in, the, in the space. Um, in terms of technology, in terms of engineering, to, to replace the driver, obviously we, we have a lot of sensors and compute that needs to come in. So I, I, was, I was talking about LiDAR, 
again, that's a new device that, that's uh, coming in the automotive industry. We've had radar in vehicles for a long time um, for blind spot detection, for uh, adaptive cruise control. Now LiDAR is coming in. Uh, again, the interesting dynamics are that as of today, there is no tier one supplier that's providing LiDAR. So the traditional suppliers in the automotive industry like Continental, Bosch, uh, Aptiv are not supplying LiDAR which opened the door to all these startups to come in because in general, it would have been really hard to penetrate this industry that's relatively closed, uh, built on long-term relationships. But now it has opened up the space to all these startups to, to, to come in. Um, and most of the LIDARs that we're looking at today, they are either built in-house or um, bought from, from, from startups. Um, radar, uh, the, the techno technological push here is to go to uh, that are called imaging uh, radar, so high resolution radar. So radar can see much better in um, poor environmental conditions, but the, the, the ones that we have in vehicles today have um, very low resolution, typically eight to a, thousand, uh, to a dozen targets. We're now seeing the push towards thousands of targets. Think of them as sort of pixels in a, in a camera. Cameras are getting cheaper and better, uh, mostly pushed by the consumer electronics, um, until recently, we had one camera in, in the car, which is the, the backup camera, and you show it to a human, and the human reacts based on what they see. Now we're moving towards eight up to 12 cameras, and most of them will not even, the, the, the data, you think of it as data, not even images, will be presented to a computer and not to a human being. Um, and then you have all the other sensors uh, around the vehicle, like GPS and uh, I am used gyros, accelerometers, all that. And then where, where does all this information go in? Most of it is fed uh, what, you know, in today's architecture, it's it's basically a, a mix of, of separate modules that we buy from different tier one suppliers. We put them together uh, and we we try to connect them. So it's, it's very spread out um, in, frankly, in an architecture that's not scalable anymore. So we're looking now at architectures that look a lot more like a, like a network. Uh, so, so someone from IT would, would be much more familiar with the future of, of the vehicle architecture than someone who is doing um, electrical architecture for vehicles for their entire career. So we're looking at much more networked uh, architectures. We're looking at more centralized compute. Um, the interesting thing is where do you separate the edge computing versus the central part um, and even there, there's the separation between doing edge computing in the vehicle. So what it's edge relative to the vehicle and what's centralized relative to the vehicle. But then the vehicle itself becomes an edge compute device relative to the entire network of, of vehicles that, that, that we have. Um, and of course, once you start talking about this kind of level of networking, you need to start talking about cybersecurity and um, making sure that not someone not only doesn't take over one vehicle, but they don't take over the entire fleet. Um, and depends what what they're trying to do with that. Is it uh, you know is it blackmail is or is it some nefarious uh, state agent that is trying to to use this as uh, you know up to level of a weapon? Um, maps uh, right now we're we're used with digital maps to tell you what to drive in the city. We need high definition maps to know exactly which lane does does what. Um, I talk about the edge versus the cloud, much more storage. Um, also, um, to go into a bit into minutia here and memory in vehicle used to be typically read uh, only or read mostly. Um, now we're going to have a lot more data writes. Um, and, and so the, the memory itself needs to be of a different caliber. Um, obviously, the connectivity between the, the vehicle and the cloud. Um, and, and the, the processors. Uh, the other interesting thing, not only we're moving really fast towards GPUs or other types of um, machine learning uh, silicon, um, but but also we're we're starting to, to to bring in a lot newer technologies from from the, the from the semiconductor industry. Typically, there used to be a big gap between the latest technological developments in silicon and when we needed it. Uh, so the semiconductor industry talks in terms of nodes. Uh, they refer to it in terms of nanometers. We're, you know, how basically how small is the transistor? Typically, in our industry, we used to to buy stuff that was three generations old. 
by then all the processes were solved. You knew how, you know, you had no issues with that. Now we're at the point where we're buying the next generation node. We're, we're down to, to five nanometer uh, chips to put in vehicles. They need to do um, safety um, decisions. So it's again, that intersection between the silicon and, and the automotive industry is becoming a lot, a lot tighter. Um, so what kind of, uh, you know, autonomy, uh, you know, what kind of impact is autonomy going to have in, in, uh, in our world? Um, you know, positives and negatives, uh, obviously life saved, but again, um, it's, it's going to be in aggregate um, and it's going to be challenging to, to, to prove to, to, to everyone how, how, how safe we are. Um, it, it's kind of like the, the parallel I draw is with autopilot in planes today. I'm sure autopilots have saved a lot of lives um, since, since they were, they were put in, in airplanes, but it's not like when a pilot lands the plane, they tell you like, well, without autopilot, I would have killed us today. Or the other way around, when, when Boeing had an issue with, with the autopilot, you hear about that immediately. You don't necessarily hear about all the life saved. So uh, the, the issue is this asymmetry that you don't know whose life you saved, but you know exactly what life you lost. Um, so it's going to be challenging in the, from that point of view. Um, you, you can have more efficient routes because you can have this sort of centralized network that distributes the vehicles, um, more efficient see through draw collaboration. So they might even come to a, a, a world or maybe even on campuses where you don't even need traffic lights. The vehicles talk to each other and they can move through in the intersections a lot more efficiently. You don't need four-way stop signs. Um, cheaper rides if you don't have a driver, uh, as I said, fewer accidents. And then freedom for the disabled, the er elderly, um, the blind. It's, it's a whole new world that you can open up. Um, on the other hand, obviously there are some disadvantages there too, like if people decide to live further out and they increase the routes. Um, I heard from an ER doctor complaining that, well, if there are no more people dead in car accidents, where is he getting his organs to save other people through transplants? So it's kind of a gruesome way to think about it. Um, infrastructure investment may be necessary because, um, again, the, the best intersection between automated where you rely 100% on the infrastructure and autonomous where you don't rely at all. It's somewhere in the middle where there's some in interaction between the, the two of them. Um, you know, there's gonna be probably some unemployment if you remove some of these drivers. On the other hand, we're gonna create jobs that we can't even think they exist today. Um, like data and annotation. So labeling things in pictures, that job simply didn't exist five years ago. Now it's a job and it's a better job than, than others that you would, you, you could have. Um, the insurance companies are, you know, uh, are, are wondering who's going to pay their pre premium. Um, uh, body shops, mom and pop body shops, uh, you know, half of their income comes in from, uh, you know, fender benders. And if we don't have fender benders, then these guys are not going to have a job. Um, in theory, we would sell fewer cars. Then again, we're probably going to use each car a lot more. So, They'll need, they need to be replaced more often. So the, the impact to society is going to be, uh, I think, significant. Um, in terms of connected vehicles, and again, the, the implication has with software, a huge, huge change. This is an industry that we used to be typically mechanical engineering. Now we're moving to, to an industry that needs to understand software as well, if not better than the mechanical engineering. And everything is changing. It's not just the the, the engineering part that you need, you're moving from atoms to bits, that you're moving from designing a component and then releasing it and moving on to the next one versus software that needs to be constantly maintained. Um, you're also changing in terms of business model because mechanical engineering, each component has an incremental cost. With software, the incremental cost is almost zero. On the other hand, with mechanical engineering, you make money at the point of sale when you sell that device. With software, you have a tremendous cost in developing the software, but then you make money throughout the lifetime of the vehicle. So it's uh, it's about recurring revenues. Um, again, the, the 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 changes that, that are happening it's are are tremendous through throughout the industry from from engineering to to business model to 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 HR um, in in terms of what the market demands for 
uh, for mechanical engineering versus versus a software person. Um, so uh, we're we're undergoing again a this this, this tremendous change that's happening through uh, through these changes. Um, electrified vehicles, as I said, the, I think to me the biggest there are two huge impacts. One is obviously on uh, on, on climate and, and our responsibility for that. Um, but also the fact that the barriers to entry uh, are, are coming down tremendously and allowing a lot more participants to, to come in. Um, but on top of that, uh, you know, you have, as I said, fewer parts, so less maintenance, um, just even silly things like brakes. You're gonna use brakes a lot less because most of the braking will be regenerative. So changing brake pads is going to become almost a thing of, of the past. Um, total cost of ownership is going to, to, to go down. Um, there's a, a huge impact on, on, again, not just the manufacturing of the vehicle, but the, the ownership and the lifetime of, of that vehicle. Um, in, in sharing, uh, again, new business models, it's all about the, the, the business model that comes in. Um, the utilization rate is going to, to become important. So you typically will want to operate fleets of shared vehicles in urban areas. As urbanization becomes bigger and bigger, um, more people moving to cities. We've seen some of the reverse of that with, with COVID. I personally think people will still come back to the cities. Um, that pushes more and more of, of the sharing of, of the vehicles because you simply can push more cars on the roads that would actually reduce your ability to be mobile. Um, you have the, the infrastructure changes that comes with EVs. Where do you charge all these? Where do you get all that, all those gigawatts of, of power to, to charge your, your, your vehicles? Um, shared autonomous vehicles will, will affect the, the cost of the driver, but the driver does more than just drive the vehicle. They do all these other things inside the vehicle, like making sure you didn't leave anything behind, making sure that if there's an emergency, they take care of you. All these things um, will, will have an impact on how we build vehicles and how you deploy them. Um, purpose built vehicles. Um, on the one hand, it may cut our revenues, our margins down because you know if if a, if a fleet owner comes in and wants ten thousand vehicles at once, they also would expect lower margins from from us or better pricing for them. On the other hand, if all vehicles are the same, the way Henry Ford said that you know we can have a, every Every, any color you want, as long as it's black, it will reduce our cost. So there's a lot of implications in that trade-off between um, the business model and engineering. And I, I look at this sort of as this feedback loop that where, where the business model informs engineering and engineering informs the, the business model. So this is basically transportation at an inflection point. And just to highlight how, how important is this decade Here's another decade that, that, that was fundamental in, in, in this change. So this is New York City in 1900. Um, and you can see a lot of horse-drawn carriages. If you have, you know, if you can find Waldo, there is one car in that picture. By 1913, this is the, the picture of New York City. And there is only one horse-drawn carriage at that time. Um, and that took 13 years to change. I contend in this decade, so people ask me a lot of times, you know, what would the automotive industry or transportation be like in 2050? And honestly, the answer is I have no idea because we're running transportation experiments throughout the world right now. Um, there are billions of dollars being invested in new concepts of transportation from <clears throat> everything that I presented to, um, you know, to, to the boring company, to, um, to UAVs, to, the changes are going to be dramatic, but all I can say is that when in 2051 we're going to look back, I pretty much guarantee you that this is going to be the decade of inflection. Where the final answer will be, I I honestly can't tell. Um, the only question is, you know, is hopefully it's going to be a better environment than than we have today, and you know the the highways in San Diego won't be as packed as as we saw them in in 2020. So that's it uh, from, from the CAN presentation. I'm um, happy to, to take questions. Okay, um, I'll start with a few questions from the chat. Um, Lakshmi asked, what made you bounce around the different companies and industries throughout your career? <laughs> um, 
it's I, I want to say that it was a uh, a, a well planned uh, move, but it honestly it never was. Um, so the the glue between them for me it's been controls. So I did you know my PhD in controls, and then after that I controlled you know stages for the semiconductor industry at the nanometer level, and then I controlled satellites that were kilometers out, and then uh, you know cars were at the meter and kilometer level. It's the math and the equations were all the, the same. The, the dimensions changed dramatically from you know nanometers to kilometers. Um, typically, I I honestly went for interesting products. Um, it it was ultimately the, the product that, that drove me. You know the, the the ability to the chance to work on um, on on satellites, the chance to work on iconic products like the iPhone, uh, the chance to work on cars, which, which I love. Um, typically it's been the product that, that drove me to work for one industry or, or another. The, the interesting thing is now looking back, um, I, I wish I could say that it was planned because every single thing that I did before, it's helping me in, in the current job. It's you know, a regulated industry like the automotive, I can draw on other regulated industry like the aerospace. Um, from from consumer electronics, from from Apple, I I can draw on you know moving fast and breaking things when it makes sense and not breaking things when it doesn't make sense. Um, that connectivity to to the consumer, that interaction with the consumer that we need to have um, and and we need to to change. Um, all the experience I had in the semiconductor industry now, you know, the, the more silicon we have in vehicles, the more that knowledge comes in into play. Um, so all these previous experiences certainly helped me in, in, in the current job. So, and, you know, to be totally honest, it's, it's also part of the Valley. There is a different mentality here that, you know, people move around. We, we think of the Valley, almost the entire Silicon Valley as being the employer. Every company that's here, it's a project that you work on. So it's almost the same as being in the same company for 35 years, but every five years working on a different group, different project. We kind of treat the Valley as such because to some extent you have to, because if you work for startups, most of them are not going to make it. So you need to think in, you need to be dynamic. You need to be fluid. You need to be able to, to move around. And, and frankly, looking the other way around as, as an employer, when I lose someone, it sucks because now I, I lost some, some knowledge. I lost someone I, I trained. On the other hand, when I bring someone in, I bring in new ideas. I bring in new knowledge. I need bring in new experiences. So it's that melding of ideas um, and experiences that I think makes makes the valley such a such an exciting place. So that brings me to my next question: um, How much of your RFR Rutgers engineering experience influenced your career choices? And the second part of that question is: Why did you decide to pursue um, a higher degree after your bachelor's? Um, I would say it was fundamental to, to what I did, even, even when I didn't work in the automotive industry. So, so first of all, even early on, it allowed me to, to have a very hands-on experience, um, putting that, the knowledge I was getting in the classroom and going to the shop in the evenings and actually putting stuff together and, and seeing where, where there was a gap between theory and practice or where I could understand better the theory by putting it in practice. Um, th there's a lot of times when, 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 you know, there is a big gap and you need to, to, to bridge that. Um, but also that, that love for, for cars, it, it, it solidified the fact that I love this, this industry and I love these, these products. Um, the, the reason I wanted to, to, to pursue a higher degree is that I, I, I wanted to, to learn more about that intersection between Mechanical engineering, software, and 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 electronics. Um, so putting them together is like again the same way I love to to bridge business and technology. I I love in, within technology I love to bridge different um, elements of it. And and controls allowed me to to make this connection between software, mechanical engineering, and and electronics. Um, and I, you know, you can do a little, I mean, frankly, at, at the undergrad level, I had one course in controls, that was it. It, it really required a lot more in-depth uh, knowledge and research to, to get to the point where you can really, uh, really apply it. 
Uh, but that hands-on experience, again, helped with my PhD also because um, I fed colleagues in the same lab who were highly theoretical, again, great respect for them, but honestly, they could describe you a, a whole car in terms of equations, but they had no idea how to change the oil. Um, being able to actually run the, you know, again, being the lab, run the simulations, but then take it to the car and seeing how things fall apart and, you know, realize that you, you miss something in simulation or something that you thought it was minor actually ends up being a big deal. Um, and, and the kind of precision that, you know, I mean, in simulation, an, an inverted pen, pendulum, you can make an inverted pendulum always stand, stand up right. You try to do that in practice, it's, it's a whole nother story. And, and again, the hands-on experience um, uh, allowed me to, to, I think, do a better research than I would have done if it was purely theoretical. So Steve Stern asks, does the rapid acceptance of electric vehicles mean that other clean types of propulsion like hydrogen uh, might, not brought, might not be brought to the mass market? No, I think it's, honestly, I think it's going to be a, a, the opposite. I think it will accelerate that. Um, so from, and, and here I need to, to draw upon the research that my colleagues have done at Ford. Um, batteries make sense up to a certain size vehicle. Um, the, the, the research that, that we're looking at it shows that hydrogen starts to make sense more for the, uh, for the big trucks, so 18 wheelers, uh, track, tractor trailer type thing. Um, so there's definitely a lot to be done in transportation with hydrogen at that level of vehicle. Um, there are uh, experimental airplanes that are running on hydrogen today. Um, Europe is pushing the hydrogen economy tremendously. Uh, US is just starting to do that also. Um, there's another interesting way to look at hydrogen too, um, as a storage device. So as we produce electricity with, with clean energy, most of it are weather dependent, so solar and wind. So you need to store them, therefore you need batteries. But another way to, to, to think of it is storing that energy by producing hydrogen. And now you store the hydrogen and you can use the hydrogen to, to produce um, energy at the time when, when, when you need to. So I think the, that interact, the, the more electric vehicles we, we have on the ground, the more we want them charged with clean energy, the more I think hydrogen would actually play a role. So, um, I mean, even if you look at the, the, how the market has reacted over the last year, if you look at some of the companies in hydrogen, they, they've gone, you know, 100 to 100 percent uh, increase in, in in the stock market uh, just in in the last year or so. Um, so I think there's a lot to be gained by by looking at hydrogen. Uh, Yusuf asks, do you think the role of a biomedical engineer will be needed more in the motor vehicle industry since safety is becoming a bigger concern concern with all the new electric cars being designed? I, I think it's all it always played a role. So understanding how how the body works, and I mean, not, not not to get too grossed out the way I got grossed out when someone first explained to me how an accident, dynamics of an accident happens. But basically, it's first is is the vehicle that hits something, then your body hits something in the vehicle, and then your internal organs hit your chest cavity, and that's when bad things start to happen. So, understanding all these dynamics um, is absolutely critical to understanding how you make. Uh, safe vehicle. So how you deploy the airbag, like we have some some very intelligent airbags today that they deploy in, in, in various stages, those can be made even more intelligent. Like if we can tell the difference, right now the, the airbag deployment is done typically based on the weight of, of the person. If we can understand if that person is an elderly or a young person, you know, are they overweight wearing a t-shirt or are they skinning wearing, wearing a parka? All these things, um, if, if we can understand how the dynamics of the body works in, 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 the, in the vehicle is combined with the vehicle dynamics, uh, I, I think that would be, that would be tremendous. Um, it would also allow us maybe to reduce um, weight in certain parts of the vehicle, which translates directly into increased range. So absolutely, there, there's a role for uh, biomedical engineers in the automotive industry. Um, let's see. Um, what was a previous major limitation um, in your field 
Um, and what did you do to overcome this obstacle? In what sense, like a particular case where we have, I, I ran into? I, I believe uh, you mean specifically with the, the, the autonomous vehicles um, while working. Oh, why we didn't deploy them at a, in, when I first did my research? Um, a, a couple of things. I mean, there, may, there have been some major changes since since then. So the first one is the is the compute power. In the kind of compute power we had in '97 compared with what we have now, it's uh, night and day. So uh, the the kind of controls I was using at the time, again, they were pretty classic non-linear controls, but they were classic controls that so they were very prescriptive. Um, pretty much all the rules had to be written in. Now um, everything. Most of the, the the vehicles that that you would see today are autonomous. So basically, you're you're teaching them how how to drive. Um, all that has been achieved because of the tremendous work that has been done in in machine learning and AI, and that has pushed companies like like Nvidia to to have better processing power. The and the more data we acquire, so the more storage you have, the more data you acquire, the easier it's to train the vehicles. Um, everything has been, you know, there has been this um, vicarious cycle of of algorithms, data storage, and and processing power that has allowed us to 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 be where we are today. There was, I mean, honestly, that would have been unimaginable at that time. Um, but as I alluded to, the interesting thing is that some of these concepts are are coming back. Um, so the the other the other issue at the time was this strong reliance on the infrastructure. And you come to the realization that the cities or states would not make that kind of investment, like or it was too much investment in the infrastructure to make uh, automated vehicles work. Now we're at the space where um, most autonomous vehicles right now have so much intelligence on them is that it makes them too expensive because we put all the intelligence on the vehicle. The pendulum is starting to swing towards the middle where because of 5G, because of... Uh, the V2, V2X, so the vehicle to something communication, we can move some of that intelligence on the infrastructure. Um, cities are getting smarter on their own. So not because of us, but because they need to know better about their infrastructure and we can ride on top of that. So if we can access the city infrastructure to know where the, all the other vehicles are, we have this bird's eye view of the entire uh, world. Uh, we can deploy some of the compute power externally so all of a sudden, the vehicle needs to be intelligent enough to be safe, but not as brilliant as we're trying to make them today because you can move some of that brilliance to the infrastructure. Um, and then you, the, the really cool thing is that some of these older concepts are coming back as in platooning. So if I have a whole bunch of autonomous vehicles, I can link them together electronically, bunch them really close, and now you have three huge advantages. One is better utilization of the road. So I can have more vehicles per per mile. Um, so I don't need to be expand the roads on, on width. Um, you get better mileage because only the first vehicle has to deal with the aerodynamics. The rest basically run in the, in the uh, slipstream. And speaking of earlier accidents, the, the, the problem with an accident happens with, is it, the, the relative speed at impact. So when, when you run into the vehicle in front of you at, at a high differential speed. But now if I drive really close to the guy in front, not that I'm recommending you to do that, um, if they slam on the brakes and I do absolutely nothing, because I'm so close, by the time I hit them, the differential speed is very low. So it's actually safer, it's counterintuitive, but if you drive really close to the car in front, it's actually um, safer. So you should drive either really far apart so you have time to stop, or really close where if you bump into them, again, I'm not recommending that, but the way we drive today, it's probably the worst. You, you dr we drive at a distance where you don't have enough time to react to stop, but by the time and by the time you hit them, your differential is pretty high. Another question in the chat: Do you think we will reach a point where there will be standardization of autonomous vehicle software and programs once the technology matures? And the second part of that question is: If so, why should a company invest and develop autonomous vehicles now when standardization will enable off-the-shelf autonomous software and programs in the future? Yeah, I think eventually there will be some some level of standardization. Most likely, there will probably be two, three, four methods out there, um, 
and the standard part, the, the standardized part would be the, the interaction between subsystems and between vehicles. Um, the reason we, we invest is that there is an advantage uh, if you are a first mover or a, for a fast follower. And there is, there's stuff to be gained if you learn really early on, because even if in the case of standardization, um, what you learn in the early days can be implemented in, in those standards. Um, and so being out there, learning, deploying the systems, um, it allows you to, to, be, to sit at the standardization table rather than just being a, a, a buyer. Um, the other thing too is, again, the, the leak into the other level. So yes, you have the full autonomy at level four, but even before then we can make cars a lot safer with, um, with ADAS systems level two plus level three, where we can make our cars safer in today's environment. And those, I, I don't think they'll, they'll really will be standardized. So. I think in the future, there'll be sort of a, a middle between those where you'll have three or four, maybe five systems out there. Um, I wouldn't necessarily call that standardization, just different answers to the same question. Um, the standardized part, I assume, will be the, the interaction between the subsystems. Um, so Tesla seems keen on using computer vision as opposed to LiDAR. Uh, could you speak to the differences between the two um, and why um, you, you've spoken a lot about LiDAR and why perhaps Tesla is, has shifted away from that? Yeah, so basically LiDAR allows you to see in environments where cameras don't see. So first of all, it's active illumination. So you can see in, in dark, you can see um, at, at sunset and sunrise in situations where the camera may not be able to see. Um, depending on the amount of power you're using, you can see further out than, than, than cameras. Um, I think it's important to, to pay attention to even what Elon Musk said is that he was referring to today's level of LiDAR. And yes, if you want to put a thousand or $2,000 LiDARs on your car, that doesn't close the business model. Again, with um, so much competition in the LiDAR space, um, I'm convinced the prices will come down. More importantly, the technology is moving. Today we have, um, you know, in my head, trying to separate, make it simple out of 100 LiDAR companies, I'm splitting them into three buckets, the, the right solution and the right now solution and something else in the middle. So the right now solution, it's optomechanical system, the spin, those systems, just from manufacturing point of view, you're not going to be able to bring the cost down enough to make sense to have them on every vehicle or even have several of them on, on every vehicle. At the other extreme, the right solution is solid state. So once you get onto the silicon uh, software curve, you're going to have this exponential improvement uh, in, in, in quality and, and, and drop in price. And then in the middle, you have MEMS and you have a few other solutions in the middle. But if you think of the world where we've gone on this silicon software curve, you can Im easily imagine that a LiDAR that can see 300 meters out can cost less than $100. And at that point in time, you can put several of them on, on a vehicle. Um, so, so the point is that it's, it's, also, it's, it's more of a technology versus business proposition. We've opted to, to put LiDAR on every vehicle for, for safety reasons. And we would rather have them on vehicles, you know, redundant and 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 go extra the extra mile to to have those sensors and later remove them once we prove to ourselves that they're not needed. Then the other way around, where you might run into some corner case situation where you actually need a lidar and you didn't have it. So running out of time here, I'll ask one more. I understand that Ford has recently partnered with Google to form Team Uplink. Uh, upshift, excuse me. Uh, so how do you predict that this collaboration will disrupt the current industry? <laughs> That's a bit too close to a, to a business <laughs> deal that, that's covered by NDA, many NDAs. And so I'm <laughs> sorry, but I can't really talk about that. Um, let's see. Um, as the level of vehicle auto autonomy uh, automation increases, uh, will the responsibility for accidents shift away from the individual and onto the producer of the vehicles? Um, that remains to be figured out between 
a bunch of uh, us, OEM, consortia, the insurance companies, regulators. So there's a lot of talk, obviously, at, at the federal level between states. Um, let's put it this way. It's not, we haven't reached a conclusion yet. Um, it's, it's something that, that, we're still, that we're still discussing. Um, so the, this um, question asks, first, do you think quantum supremacy will have the dominant occupation in the future development of autonomous vehicles? And secondly, uh, do current, current autonomous vehicles have the high limitations to drive further distance? Um, so the, for the first one, we're definitely looking at quantum computers. Um, I don't know if the first applications will be towards autonomous vehicles. Um, I think the stuff that we're looking at probably considering how quantum computers work in terms of optimization, most likely it's going to be in chemistry, in materials, in probably in other parts. I, I can imagine more towards the, the chemistry of the batteries more than anything else uh, before we apply them to autonomous vehicles. But clearly it's, it's going to, to open a, a whole new area of, of research. Um, you're talking about distance of autonomous vehicles in what sense? Um, I believe like city driving versus um, long distance highway driving. Yeah, I mean, so for the time being, the, the two are somewhat separated, as I said, for robo taxis, you need to handle both. Um, and I think that would be particularly challenging. Um, I think if you split them into where you restrict some vehicles only to city and others only to highway, um, it, it makes the technology relatively easier to, to, to implement. Um, you'll see mostly in level three that you have highway driving under autonomous mode and city driving under manual mode. So there'll be a, a long period of time where there will be some mix between different levels of, of autonomy. Okay. And last question is a fun one. What is your favorite car? <laughs> Um, I'm still waiting to get with the Maki in the garage. I know it's been produced. It's coming in. I, I had the chance to drive some early prototypes. Uh, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. I love it. Very cool. Um, I think that brings us to the close of our session today. Well, thank you. This was a lot of fun for me. Uh, if, if there are other questions I can answer later by email anytime, and I'm always happy to help. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks.